Okay, we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Jamacon's specially featured panel. We have for you today a delightful opportunity to put some questions forward to the man responsible for this entire event's existence, I would say. Um, welcome, uh, Mr. Jeff Grubb. We are absolutely honored to have you here with us today. Glad to be here. Wow. Glad to hear it. Um, I'm joined by uh, my co-host, uh, God Mode. You may know him of Twitch fame, uh, Mr. Jason. Um, I'm riding shotgun. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually taking back seat. We'll let Jeff take front seat. <laughs> yeah. There's a reason why our boxes are smaller and Jeff's boxes are bigger. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I rate. You are. <laughs> you are the king of the castle today, Jeff. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, we will be pulling questions from the chat. So if you have anything that you would like to ask Jeff about uh, Spelljammer or any of his other various works, uh, obviously uh, there is an, a veritable catalog of different topics you could ask Jeff. I mean, uh, I've considered some about theater and coin collecting amongst other things, but you've been reading the blog. Oh so. yeah. Oh yeah. We've done our homework. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, unless there's anything else that needs to be said, uh, Jason, is there anything you want to say before we kick off here? Uh, no, I'm I'm ready to dive into things. Okay, uh, Jeff, anything you want to put out towards the people before we get started? No, I think we're ready to rock. Let's let's see, let's see what's up there. Okay, awesome. Uh, so let's get our first question out of the way. Uh, just uh, Jason, do you want to take the first one for me? Yeah, I know, Jeff, you've done probably a million different interviews, so we're trying to think of some stuff that may be more engaging for you that you may not have heard 500 times. I know you talked told about... the story 500 times, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I know you've talked about your inspirations for Spelljammer, but this is, uh, you know, it came out during a period of time where a number of action cartoons were releasing along all these toy lines and many of them mm -hmm. having sort of this sci-fi fantasy angle to them. You know, when I think of Spelljammer, I regularly think back as we were kind of talking about pre-stream here of those late eighties cartoons that I watched as a kid growing up stuff like brave star and silver Hawks. I don't know if you remember any of these galaxy Rangers. Mm -hmm. um, and so my question for you is did any of the action cartoons or shows or movies of that time influence you for a Spelljammer? No, but just because by that time I wasn't watching, you know, uh, Saturday morning cartoons as much. Mm -hmm. However, you know, basically there was an influence. There was a whole series of Hanna Barbera cartoons back in the uh, 60s, 70s, Space Ghost. And the Herculoids. Oh, yeah. Thundar oh, yes, the Barbarian. Okay. Uh, those had like a little bit more influence as far, far as that was concerned. And one Saturday morning they like had everybody team up. They had like a, a story that started in the Space Ghost cartoon and then went to the Herculoids and then then went to the <laughs> Moby Dick cartoon. Yes, they had a uh, a cartoon about Moby Dick at one point, you know, and it just went through the whole, like three hours worth of, you know, interlaced uh, cartoonery. Um, so those are those, I think, had a influence as far as, you know, like the background, the feeling, the Wahoo nature that Spelljammer mm -hmm. so embodies. So there was, was an influence there, but it was, wasn't the later stuff. It wasn't the, the toy cartoons mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that right. come out. Okay. It wasn't, the, wasn't G.I. Joe or the Inhumanoids or the uh, um, or Brave Star or that, you know, that, any of the that other. That was my like, heyday, from yeah. Mars. Yeah. <laughs> so. There you go. Pirates of Darkwater, although that, that was oh, yeah. post-Spelljammer, post but a great show. Yep, there was not, actually, I looked up and I was uh, uh, looked up and uh, I never saw Treasure Planet. Oh. Which was a like a John Bluth cartoon, and that was like three years after Spelljammer came out. Yeah, so that, yeah. that sort of like sort of explains that's, you know that sort of thing. That's, that's my, how I yeah. You I was wondering you're how about to say what I'm about gonna to say, say the same say. thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's <laughs> how we tell people what Spelljammer is like. It's, it's Treasure Planet with more swords and sorcery. Yeah, exactly. That's a <laughs> very a very common theme you'll see on message boards and uh, yeah. Reddit posts when people go, "What is this?" This this uh, wacky spell jammer thing that everyone's talking about. Um, <laughs> they will probably have to. Have this, friends will eventually kidnap me and make me watch it. So <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, just to piggyback off of that, this wasn't a question that I, I had down, but um, you mentioned that Treasure Planet came out three years after Spelljammer, right? And it very clearly had a lot of similarities. 
Um, are you familiar with a potential Spelljammer reference in the much-famed uh, Matt Groening TV show, Futurama, where the encyclopod is a ginormous manta ray-like creature that flies through space and has a terrarium on its back? I missed that one. Okay, yeah, it sounds like something like had more influence with Silent Ru Silent Running, which was an old, you know, uh, 60s, 70s uh, science fiction film that dealt with the last forests, which are on a spaceship, you know, oh, out past cool. Jupiter. Uh, uh, it was in that post Star Wars universe. Right. The um, but no, I I wasn't aware, but I do know that Graining did a lot, made a lot of D and D references uh, mm. early on. There was like yeah. they they uh, uh, took one of the, one of the pets to to the vet. There's a rust monster there in the in the lobby, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of pop culture reference to it, yeah. but I didn't know about that. I did I, not know about I, the, I, it. Uh, it's it comes in the in like the backdrop of Bender, you know, the titular uh, robot yeah. character. Uh, mm -hmm. playing as a character called Adamantius Cogshire or something along those lines. And Matt, uh, and, uh, sorry, and uh, Gary Gygax actually makes a appearance in the cartoon as, okay. like, as a voice and like drawn by Matt Groening. So I imagine that yeah. there, there probably is something there. It's... It, uh, Gary did make an appearance mm -hmm. in a uh, um, Futurama cartoon where he you yes. know, says, I am Rolls Dice, pleased yes. to meet you. Oh, so, that's right. Yeah. I remember that's that. So good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's his classic line. And that, so. and, <laughs> and that entire like sequence is all about this, um, this D, D20, that every time it rolls, they go into a new situation. So I, I feel like they're... The uh, the team on um, Futurama may a have lot, played a lot of, a lot of, oh a lot of people have played D and D and Spelljammer and Forgotten Realms and all these other campaign settings mm -hmm. over the years. So it's sort of like a glue, a foundation point. That a lot of uh, creatives who are now deciding what type of you know shows we're watching, who are now selling stuff in, like oh yeah, I played that when I was a kid. So you know, I, actually I always joke that I went from uh, I played your games to. My, my my parents played your games too. We were cleaning out Grammy's attic and <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. we found something with your name on it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah that's for sure. Um, so uh, my, my first question, I think this is a highly anticipated question. It's one that we see uh, a lot on message boards. Um, essentially the recent release of Spelljammer for fifth edition has brought about some quite substantial changes to the nature of the setting. Uh, in your prior emails to Harbs Narbs, you stated a hope that we would see evolution and change. One change yes. in particular has generated a flurry of debates, uh, namely the substitution of the Astral Sea in place of the Phlogiston. My question yes. for you is, as both the author of the Manual of Planes for Ad Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and the designer mm -hmm. of Spelljammer, did you mm -hmm. ever consider implementing the Astral Plane as the intermediary yeah. space? Further, what are your personal thoughts on that substitution? We um, we did not consider that okay because you know the astral the astral plane the uh, the the, uh, the ethereal the whole great wheel that had its own cosmology and it's completely a completely different setup and that was more for the you know, for the pure fantasy side of it mm -hmm. we were pushing in a different direction we wanted to basically uh, expand out and we create effectively a different way of moving from campaign to campaign as opposed to portals because we do have ships as opposed to you know gates and that basically so so you know whereas manual planes had more of a stargate sort of mentality we had a lot more of a star wars star trek type mentality with the journey as part of what's there um one of the reasons we went to crystal spheres is that we were with stars you know we were always talking about moving uh constellations around uh basically creating you know basically as a reflection of what's going on on earth and okay well if there are stars how is this having an effect in a realistic space you uh universe mm -hmm. and so the crystal spheres the stars themselves are mounted on the inside of the spheres we can keep each campaign uh closed to itself uh dark sun which was launching about the same time didn't have any access at all so we can say okay it's a crystal sphere it's over here you can't go visit it mm -hmm. um but you know the, the idea that we allowed a little more control for the home campaigns while being able to connect those campaigns in the same prime material plane as part of it. 
Now, um, as one of the things, and I have not, I have not read the new spell check. Okay. I have not gotten a copy. Um, <clears throat> Wizard of the Coast is about three miles away from where I live. <laughs> no one, no <laughs> one happened to drop by and say, "Hey, we just got a copy." No, it hasn't happened yet. So I'll Your name's eventually in the front print of the like, book at least. So I, I know there was a th- I know mm-hmm. I saw the, saw the credit mm-hmm. page and basically it had mm-hmm. a nice little you know based on the material by and I think that's you know that's fair. Yeah, that's you know, I've got, and particularly because you know a lot of the ships they brought in were stuff that uh, Jim Holloway and Dave LaForce put together. Jim Holloway did the initial art. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dave LaForce did the deck plans. And I'm looking, seeing people are posting up the you new know, deck plans. They look look like they've got the flavor and the spirit of what we did way back when. And, you know, that, that sort of thing. The whole, you know, grubby and physics and gravity planes and all the rest of that. They've, they've kept that. Yeah. But uh, the Crystal Spheres worked out very nice because it allowed us to create an area which did not obey necessarily the same rules as your home campaign. Each mm-hmm. campaign had its own, you know, sort of flavor and reality within its crystal sphere. So you don't have to worry about, well, that's not how it works over the realms. That's nice. The realms is over here. Mm-hmm. You know, this, this, we're in the area. Now, is the Astral Sea and the Astral Plane one and the same within the new edition? So Wild Space and the Astral Sea encompass the Astral Plane. They're like two okay. parts. So uh, they consider them overlapping. Yes, overlapping. How they yeah. deem it. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna probably have to do some digging on that. See, because we ended up doing that with like the ethereal plane. Yes, there was the border ethereal and the deep ethereal. The border ethereal was the area that was closest to reality, mm-hmm. and therefore you had things like ghosts and stuff that was ethereal, which you could still mm-hmm. see. And then you walk deeper into the fog, and that becomes the deep ethereal, which is sort of becomes the transitive plane that allows you to go from. Uh, uh, a, a to the elemental planes to the positive of the material planes the ethereal was tied in with the inner planes whereas the astral was tied in with the great wheel and the outer planes so right, that's, right. A, yeah. that's how that and, and spell jammer of course said that's nice we're over here we're gonna get in the ship <laughs> we're gonna go through the crystal sphere we're gonna get to the get to new places so yeah, I, sure. I still think that y- the way that you developed Spelljammer is unique in a lot of ways because when I started running Spelljammer games, most of the inspiration where I drew from to craft my own homebrew world using Spelljammer as a setting was hard sci-fi stuff. I was trying to think I... circular worlds and you know what are realistic uh, you know, ways of gravity and your, your content was so wonderful because I'd look through the pages and it'd say, you can have a giant carrying a planet. Stop mm-hmm. thinking yes. of the, the same mentality you do and, and think you more can fantastic. turtles all the way down. Stop you, 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 thinking yeah. like a but ground we can we can do Dyson spheres, which you know, are, are a bit yeah. SF mm-hmm. version of the crystal mm-hmm. sphere concept. The, uh, we can have ring worlds. We can have you know worlds filled with just asteroids and islands. We can basically go with you know folklore backgrounds, and all of that fits in because again the uh, the presence of the crystal spheres and uh, phlogiston is gives us a lot more variety as far right, as and right. particularly for people to bring in their home campaigns. You know mm-hmm. if they've got a particular mindset, they don't have to mm-hmm. modify it too much in order to bring it into uh, where you know into D and D. It's it's easier to lift other people's stuff and put put it into your home campaign that way. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I still think it's unique in that respect because you have a lot of you have a lot of different systems that will take uh, you know a portion of their content and throw it into the future. And it, it, it yeah. typically adopts that idea of like hard sci-fi. You're on a Star Trek ship, but you're still an mm-hmm. elf. And that is what, to me, makes Bloodjam unique, that it's still like, stop thinking in that methodology, break out of the box. It could be, you know, turtles on turtles or whatever, a flat world or just mm-hmm. a disc. So Gi- really giants cool. holding holding up worlds, you know, yeah. Atlas holding up the sky. You know, all of that's got, you know, like, if, if you want to go in that direction, that's cool. But by the same token, it has a common, uh, with with the ships, with how the, jammer, the jammers operate, that sort of thing. It gives us a commonality that allow you to go, mm. yes, we're going to go to this crystal... Uh, uh, sphere and we're going to have this set of adventures then we're going to go to that crystal sphere and have that set of, and it allows you that that versatility um i was a p- big player of traveler back in the day oh, and man. i thought travelers you know basically you have have the uh, hex grid and you've got the got the planets and you know where the waypoints are and then basically the jump points and you know you've got a code for what's there but it often makes it difficult to create 
unique planets or ones that break a lot of rules or mm -hmm. ones that because you're you're just hitting one small patch of land within a huge planet you know what's there and how does it how does it you know what types of stories you tell out mm -hmm. of that so absolutely now one of the one of the reasons um we went with phlogiston as being the stuff that you know that's made up between the worlds and it being explosive in part, I was thinking about this the other day because someone had mentioned, you know, well, you know, why don't they have cannons, that sort of thing? Well, we didn't have that many cannons in part because, well, phlogiston explodes. Hmm. So it, it, it's hmm. basically – so it's much more of a risk than – that's why you're carrying around your uh, uh, ca your catapults and your ballista and your mangonels and all the other, you know, siege material and you're putting it on your ship. Hmm. Again, that commonality that they all work from. The, the GIF, they'll go with cannons, but then the GIF – get blown up on a regular <laughs> they don't basis. get very far so, mm -hmm. I, I would have given yeah. them a lot more fire resistance if i had thought about it so. okay. that, that's an interesting takeaway i think that that mm -hmm. would have been a cool addition to the race in fifth edition the original if they, could, if they could do yeah fire resistance mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh do you have a, another question lined up for us jason uh i've been keeping an eye on chat uh chat again you are welcome to ask some questions let me see here uh Cesar says let me see General question, what's the story behind getting the GIF and Spelljammer? I remember reading something about creating smoke powder to get them into the book. Okay, have... yeah, uh, we've always been hesitant about gunpowder itself and gunpowder weapons. Um, mm. Ed Greenwood did a really good article that showed how absolutely bad uh, medieval... Uh, uh, gunpowder weapons were mm. uh if you were going to be historical and just you know but nobody paid attention to that so the question of how are you going to get it so we had smoke powder which was a gunpowder replacement to some degree and it could work in certain campaigns the realms and not work in other campaigns but again the crystal spheres and their laws of their own physicality allows us to you know basically turn those on and off as we see fit so smoke powder itself became sort of our replacement it's enchanted it's magical it basically has a different you know it's not a chemical process as opposed to a mechanical process so basically that allowed us to get a gunpowderish thing into the game because we did not really want to talk about guns in D D in those right, particular right. that era so uh, i see okay um we have a, another question from chat here. Uh, it says, what is your favorite aspect of the plasmoids in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons? I mentioned the the Herculoids, okay? And the, and the plasmoids actually descend from Star Frontiers, the Dralocytes, which mm -hmm. were Zeb Cook's creations, so, and they were the plasmoid beings. And they themselves feel like they were second cousins of uh, Gloop and Gleep, who were these blobby comic relief characters in the Herculoids, which was a great, was for those who have not seen it, have not yet gone over to YouTube to see, see if it's there, uh, was a uh, primitive family with a uh, dragon that basically shot uh, lasers out of its eyes and an, an eight-legged triceratops armored beast that would fire things out of its, uh, out of its horns, a big rock ape, and Gloop and Gleep, which were these plasmoid type bendable type stuff. It was it was a really cute, wild little cartoon. And the stories were, you know, pretty much Saturday morning adventures type stuff. Um, but where you know there's some threat and they must deal with it. So oh, another action cartoon at the beginning that was uh, you know influential in mindset, um, Donny Quest. You know, we never really went this space. So there was Even that I nature that of that high tech, you know, high tech type of walking mm. spider robots and everything. So mm -hmm. that's yeah, okay. That's yeah. a good, good question. There, Does Jack. that work? Yeah, that's yep. perfect. Okay. Um, okay. How about one of your own questions, Jason? You got uh, yeah. Of... I this this may open uh, some conversation here. <laughs> uh, Dungeons and Dragons, the system as a whole, it's gone through a variety of changes over the different additions over the years, gameplay mechanics and rule sets that were once entertained for the game have either been modified or cut down altogether as the game continue to, it continues to grow and evolve. We, we know you had a hand in, in the reviving, you, you had no hand in reviving Spelljammer, obviously for fifth edition, but in a hypothetical situation where you were brought in to lead its development for this latest edition, were there any big changes with Spelljammer that you would personally have made to maybe better suit the current 5th edition audience? 
Yeah, and I'm not sure if they've done this or not. So you can tell me if if okay. I, but I well, really we'll confirm. Liked, yeah, yeah. I really liked what they did in uh, Secrets of Salt Marsh, which was a hardbound uh, adventure series that they put together in hardback for uh, for uh, fifth edition, where they talked uh, about ship design. And they talked about uh, hull points and talked about combat. And I thought, yeah, that worked out nicely. I, I thought they did a good job with that. I don't know if they've done that over in the new Spelljammer. But that is was definitely a piece where um, I said, ooh, that's nice. I'd take that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> The um, One of the big things I always, I'm always going on about for game design is that it evolves. And we you know, basically build on our predecessor, stand on the shoulders of giants, you know, we see things that people we like, mechanics that function, uh, stuff that we can improve, things that, well, that doesn't quite work out. How about if we do this and find, you know, we, we go into um, times when we want to be more realistic and more detailed, more granular, mm -hmm. and places where we want to be simpler and more accessible and playable. And seeing that conversation going forward, I think it's one of the cool things about design, is that people can keep, you know, adding on to it. And it's still got room to grow. We have not, you know, reached any type of plateau where this is the ultimate game system. Yeah. And I think we will continue to see it evolve. So basically when I said, I would steal that component. I would steal that component. Okay. So, mm -hmm. That's good. Now, I don't, do they have anything like that? How they handle ship-to-ship -ship combat in uh, uh, the new edition? Funny, funny that you mention it because you mentioned secrets of salt marsh, right? As something mm -hmm. that you would like to uh, use as a, you know, a place to source inspiration. I feel like the Spelljammer mechanics in the current rendition of Spelljammer were more or less pulled from Ghosts of Salt Marsh, which is a uh, a port forward in fifth edition of the original U series of Salt that's Marsh. The one, that's the one I'm talking about. Yes. I, sorry, yeah. I, didn't, didn't, I, yeah. I, I Secrets of Salt Marsh was one of the pieces that they pulled from. Right. But again, in a, pulling it together yes. and um, got the edition somewhere here on the, on the voluminous mm -hmm. shelves. Um, but that that that's that's actually the version I'm talking yeah. about. So. so Secrets of Salt Marsh was the original U part of the U and UK series, which were done in England. Yeah, by Cambridge, the, uh, correct, was what they used to... TS, TSR UK. Yeah. So we had you know, some very nice stuff that came out of that. Yeah, that's one of my favorite classic sets is the U series. Um, okay, no, I think that's that's uh, that's a great question. Mo uh, most of us in the community are of that mind. It feels as though the, the latest roles are a trimmed down version of what we got from Ghost of Saltmar. So a lot of mm -hmm. people are saying, if you want something a little more than just what looks like a ship stat block... Uh, you can go into that book, and that's going to give you some more meteor. You know, it's going to easily be translated from from sea combat yeah. to to space combat Basically. without too and, much. And that's an analog that makes a transition fairly straightforward. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. We, yeah. Have, we have mm -hmm. the standard sailing ship in space. Therefore, that's a good foundation to be able to bring things across. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, the design philosophy is clear all the way through. Um, so I have another question loaded up for you here. Um, so we've asked you a lot about your uh, inspirations thus far. So I think uh, maybe uh, a, a little bit of a more personal question uh, I have is um, in October of 1988, uh, we as fans were blessed with the first novel of the Finder's Stone trilogy, As Your yes. um, mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure as many of the viewers are aware, um, those series of novels were co-authored by yourself and your wife, Kate Novak, correct? That's true. Um, now, as someone myself who has immersed their life into TTRPGs, I find it completely impossible not to bounce ideas off of my partner. Uh, while you were conceptualizing Spelljammer, did Kate ever weigh in on the setting? And if so, what did she think of the original concept? No, we did not directly at the mm. time. Uh, we were working, you know, within the realms at that point. We were not doing that. We did bring a Spelljammer ship in later, a flying ship, in one of the uh, uh, sequel in, um, I don't know if it was Timora's Luck or Finder's Bane. But basically, we, we had the evil, the evil, uh, uh, Linda, you know, basically, you know, had a, uh, um, uh, captured the uh, the sailing sh flying sailing ship the uh, um, spelljammer and uh, uh, flayed the you know 
uh, GIF first mate and basically hung him from the front uh, of the uh, front of the uh, of the uh, of the ship. It was, it was quite gory, um, mm-hmm. which was interesting because we had um, named we had with Linda and we based her on a friend of ours and we made the mistake of telling the friend this and as we kept making this character more and more evil we had to keep coming back saying we're not really basing her that much on you it's just your sort of physical no and she was happy about the idea go, what other horrible things are we going to do to do with this character um so we did have that little uh piece of that mm-hmm. we had in the comic books we uh started a character jasmine who was also in the later novels, Finder Space, mm-hmm. who was basically a Forgotten Realms character, and we brought her over when we did a Spelljammer comic book from DC, of which Kate did a short story and a little short vignette night for an annual, mm-hmm. and I did one issue of it uh, that was part of the, uh, um, I think Joe Casada was the uh, uh, artist on that one. Um, and this was, again, back late 80s. This was, you know, the late part of the DC license that we had. But we did a spell jammer in which they had a small jammer, a miniature spell mm-hmm. jammer that they were uh, basically flying around in. As part of it. So basically we did have that sort of contact point. But as far as when we were designing uh, spell jammer, not so much for Kate. Okay. Not, not, so, not so much. Like, I mean, it was very much, you know, um, I'd say, you know, the, the group with the most influence was, you know, myself, Jim Holloway, Dave LaForce, Steve Winter, who was the lead editor. If you look at the credits for the original mm-hmm. Spelljammer box set, you see there's a lot of editors listed there because <laughs> this was one of those where we came up with the idea to get it out when we needed to get it out. We had to, you mm-hmm. know, a uh, brigade system just to get everybody under there. The leader of the brigade was uh, mm-hmm. Steve Winter. So that's awesome. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want to head to chat for another question? Uh, what have we got in here? Oh, here we go. The that boffin was I was man. telling you about earlier. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he says, please ask Jeff if he thought about the implications that his 3E and 4E manual of the planes work would have on Spelljammer. 3E and 4E. Okay, the original spell jam, uh, original Manual of the Planes, mm-hmm. was Manual of the Planes, right? Mm-hmm. It, was, it was basically mm-hmm. like for first edition. It was part of that yes. extension of that, that for it. The 3E version was done with Wizards of the Coast uh, for as far as rearranging. We tried to do a bunch of different types of um, uh, worlds. We, we presented it. At the time, we wanted to show the planes as a tree as opposed to the great wheel and that was that was that well it's an opinion here's here's how it would work that sort of thing so the manual of the planes for the third edition was very much more of a uh, workbook type of thing if this is the type of thing you can do so it's uh so it was very much uh, we've come up with all these wonderful things please don't use them basically go off and create your own and so that was a different design approach than we had for the original where we were trying to codify and bring everything together and basically have think all the stuff that we've said about the planes up to that point and have it make some semblance of sense. You know, and basically that was working off of uh, some articles by Steve Marsh originally, who was the first person who really brought forward the idea of the outer planes, not as a wheel, but as a box and you could go up to ancient dragon magazines and see that and how it all fits together mm-hmm. uh, as far as that i'm not sure so, so certain that you know three and four he had nearly i mean as part of the evolution uh of how we got to the current edition of of spell jammer uh definitely the influence there but I'm, i don't necessarily know how it would fit in directly at this point i mean for fourth edition and fifth edition particularly up to now there was a lot of taunting involved uh, oh yeah oh, there's a spell jammer oh look there's a gif over here there's a there's a uh a spell jammer ship and basically everybody would, would get online and say spell jammer has been an out no they're just just winding you up people <laughs> so the pain because there are a lot of old fans there who love the old settings mm-hmm. as well so yeah. and, and they're you know they're running things absolutely uh, they they riled us up for, they, for many years oh, when 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 yeah, they put, when they that's, put that's the scavenger my... in <laughs> water deep i was yes i was about to just like throw my computer out a window <laughs> they did uh it's they like, did give it that. to me give it to me <laughs> yeah. they did the april fools where they confirmed it uh before yes. they actually confirmed it and i yes. just wanted to throw myself out of a window i was like no <laughs> oh this I'm, is the worst I'm, I'm glad they did it so yeah. you know because me too, it's, me too. yeah um and now the planescape people 
are getting to, you know, right, get, yes. getting to say, okay, apparently end of next year, you know, they yeah, say they're yes. going to be doing a Planescape, which I think has got some great, you know, ability there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to see a lot of crossover between Spelljammer and Planescape now. I think sure. you will. Yeah. I think you will. I think mm -hmm. you're seeing a lot of the ships are going to show up, you know, in one and the other now because Absolutely. you've got the merging of the astral plane and the astral sea and wild space. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jason, you got any more questions on your end? Um, I have a personal question um, that was not on our original pre-read list, uh -oh. but I'm curious. So if there's any, <laughs> any territory you don't want to talk about. But okay. we ha I recently Cut watched through... No, 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 no. <laughs> I, re I recently watched through the latest Stranger Things. It was a great season. I love the show because as Incredible. I was talking about, I love the, the you know nostalgic feel of the 80s. And of course, the latest season, no spoilers, but it deals with the topics of the satanic panic, uh, you know, running from the 80s through the 90s. And I know you already sort of touched on that talking about the smoke powder. But I was curious, Jeff, if there were any other elements during the design, maybe specifically for Spelljammer, where you guys came together and said, let's tiptoe around these subjects because you know for for whatever reason I, i've always been curious about that if that affected no your, not, your not really time. we had an internal um set of standards mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. was based on the comic book code from the you know 50s and 60s that we use that as a basis and that became you know where why we would not do certain things and why we would do certain things and we wouldn't go pushing too hard to the edge and you i i think that was used as sort of a design approach in general but there is wasn't any point oh gosh that we definitely said now nah, we can't do that you know okay, yeah they cool, basically, cool. basically they, <laughs> they'd have us hanging by our thumbs before the ink was dry you know and that's what it was. okay now i did get hate mail during the satanic uh, panic, really, uh, somebody would come in to a, the bookstore and pick off like manual, a man, monster manual two, and get a whole list of all the credits, and then write hate mail to those particular mm. people and sent it care of TSR. So I'm getting fan mail, and I basically open it up. There's one saying, "You know, God will judge you, and I will be His instrument." <laughs> I'm, and I, first thing I do is I check the sounds like you know, a D and D return, character. It the does. return address, and I find out he's it's been mailed from Kenosha. And I'm going, okay. And I'm, I'm a little concerned. I go into Kim Mohan's office. Kim was the head of Dragon Magazine as well as an editor for for uh, um, uh, for the design department. And very calmly said, <laughs> and you know, and and Kim just opened the bottom of his uh, desk drawer and says, "Drop it in with all the others." You know? <laughs> <laughs> that calmed me down to some degree, because <laughs> he because it's Dragon Magazine. He got hate mail on a regular basis, so yes. so this was this was this was so yes, but the panic was real, mm -hmm. and we did get stuff. And we did get, you know, warnings of from time to time. Um, so th th that was just, you know, that was part, part but internally, um, Jim Ward, who was our uh, boss at the time, lead designer, uh, was, uh, you know, always concerned about the angry mothers from heck. And so he was, you know, we, we kept a very strong feeling on you know keeping an eye mm. on you know basically not getting outside uh he hated nipple rings on al uh that's mm -hmm. something we did back off on uh and he got a letter of uh, a complaint letter basically for al saying thing obviously on page 167 you show genies obviously in foreplay and he came storming up the <laughs> desk and Andrea Hayday, who was my editor, and said, we need to talk. And I got this letter and it says, do we, did we do this? And we, we said, well, let's look it up. We looked up page one. And said, it was two genies playing chess. Oh, no. You know, <laughs> someone was really reading into the situation. So playing it forward. So, yeah. yeah. But we, we got that on a regular basis. I mean, basis, that so. never, ne that never stopped Gerald Brom from, uh, putting enough nipple rings to, you know, save the whole planet <laughs> of Dark Sun. Uh, yes. Athens. Well, uh, again, the great Neva picture uh, in the armor and everything mm -hmm. was um, done before he came on board. And oh, they were working. We uh, Troy and um, Tim Brown, Troy Denning and Tim Brown, were the ringleaders on Dark Sun. And they were starting to put things together and uh, uh, 
Brom was moving in. He was moving in with the art department with the others, Jeff Easley and Larry Elmore and Clyde Caldwell and Keith Parkinson. And basically, you know, he was joining that team. He's setting up his art. And there was this picture and it showed uh, what is now Neva with a dragon flying mm. in the upper right hand corner. And I said, you know, it's I, iconic. You know, that get rid of that dragon. That could be a good piece. So, yes. That's... Yeah. Bra- Brom, Brom hit, hit the wall a couple of times. He, he did an Elves of Apis cover that uh the head of the company felt was a little too come hither that's a great way oh yeah you tone (laughs) tone it down a little a little too centralized so (laughs) so we did have those types of discussions on Mm -hmm. okay and one more i don't know if i should tell this story but uh um (laughs) this was this was uh council of worms box set bill slavisek uh, lead designer and he was uh, Jim summoned him down to the office and he said I'm looking at the blue lines here and I, I just can't believe you did this you're talking about dragon sex and how they basically you know fly together and they they intertwine their uh, uh, le- their uh, um, necks as they basically fly and then plummet to the ground like you know like bald eagles that sort of thing you know to consummate the relationship <laughs> mm-hmm. and Bill just is looking stunned at him <laughs> I, I didn't do any of that. No, because it turned out the editor <laughs> basically put it all in. <laughs> the editor had added this section. And so Bill had to go through the entire manuscript to see what the editor had taken out in order to create the room to put in this section <laughs> on dragon sex. And um, was, and they did they did so. Was, so. So, yes, there's stuff that happens behind the scenes all the bloody time as far wow. as... Our, our was, was the editor like a young Patrick Rothfuss? Because he's got a thing for writing about <laughs> dragon sex in his yeah. novels. No, so. no, they, they, this one did not. <laughs> um, yeah. But... Um, <laughs> But this, 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 this one, one thing to say, I think the influence <laughs> for dragons from that era was much more Anne McCaffrey okay. and, you know, Dragonflight and all of that, that sort of mm-hmm. you know, series of novels as far as origin of the dragons type of things. Of course, our own Dragonlance. So. All right. uh, well, back to the questions in the chat again. Here. Yes. Uh, yes. Just, just... I will digress. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I would love to hear more of these kinds of stories. Yes, but, please. Um, <laughs> Uh, we do have a like a kind of similar question that uh, keeps popping up. Um, different people mm-hmm. vote of different ways. Uh, Nick of um, uh, Tales of the Voidfarer, um, uh, Big Mac again, uh, a couple others, uh, basically asking you how you would handle implementing settings that were released post Spelljammer. Now, uh, I I know that you are you know one of your favorite projects you ever worked on. Obviously, was um, Al Kadim correct um and then there's obviously Jacandor and uh, other uh, various settings that you worked on personally but even more expansively uh, to that there are now like full-blown settings like eberron right and, yes eberron would be on my list right if, if eberron existed back then you would have seen a clockwork you know uh flying orrery out there as far as you know for as far as tying in that so. whole uh uh sort of clock punk mentality mm-hmm. we we did a little bit of that with the gnome ships you know because they, they basically are the inventors and the tinkers and that mm, sort of thing yeah, and, yeah. and we ended up with giant space hamsters as a result uh so i would have gone further with that particularly for eberron mm-hmm. uh dark sun as i said was at the time and they just you know sort of sealed it off al kadim was in development at that point for the luca uh convention in uh luca italy uh, a few two two three years ago um i was a guest there and i wrote a um an adventure to run there called under the angry sun and i'm probably going to run it again on stateside and it was a spelljammer al kadim mashup in which you were basically the vizier, the great wizard, basically fought an ultimate evil, but has now disappeared, and you have to go find him. And you're you're basically taking a uh, a traditional uh, spell jammer ship, and you're basically going out to where he was last, you know, last known was was, was some far 
far off, you know, planetoid mm -hmm. and basically finding out what he did in order to defeat that evil and what necessarily has to be done. And you encounter a nautiloid in there and you have a traditional run through the type dungeon stuff at the end. It was about four hours. It was a nice little adventure. And I'm, I'm going to ex exhume it. I think I'm going to run it at Gary Con just oh. because. So I have done that type of mashup before. Al Khadim was based in. Um, uh, the Forgotten Realms, so it was sort of like taken care of by traditional fantasy. But we did do a Canthan type of ship, you know. So we could have gotten away probably with doing something Latin rigged, maybe a Dow, that sort of thing that was be uh, create create something that would be specifically for it. But the fact that they came along after is uh, one of the big reasons I never really worried about the spell jammer. Right, absolutely. I mean, from from my knowledge, the only reference I had ever seen in any of the al um line was in City of the Lights um, about okay. um, the featured city of that book uh, being open to spell jammers. I don't believe yes. you were um, you wrote that one. That was um, I don't think I no, did. I don't think so. um, I can't remember exactly that, who. We, we, uh, we, did, we could dig it up. Someone, someone on the chat could basically dig it up. Yeah. I want to say I want to say it was Ormuz. As far as the city itself, yes. I um, so. But you know, again, I'm pulling out pulling out of ancient memory here, and don't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, <laughs> and we have people in the chat who actually say they would love to like run that adventure that you just mentioned. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, okay. Um, if you, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe, maybe you know, we can we can think something up um, beyond um, that. Yeah, go on, Jason. You got questions. I was, was going to say, there's one from All Dragon here from yeah. Jeff. It says, Can Jeff share anything he knows about the canceled Infinity Sphere product that we only got details about in the Encyclopedia Magica? No, I can't, to be honest with you. Um, and the behind the scenes reason is by that time I was off working on something else. Mm, okay. Uh, Okay. Usually I'd be working on a line for about the first year and a half, you know, of which the pro main product would show up about eight months in um, and then oversee the next few. And then Jim would come up and pry my fingers. Jim Ward would come up and pry my fingers off of that, you know, chosen child and send me <laughs> off in a new direction. Oh, no. And yeah, and, and, and that, was, that was actually very nice. We got to do, I got to do a lot of cool stuff, spell jammer, mm -hmm. and everything. And, but as a result, it went on to other hands and other designers and other people in charge. And that's cool. I've seen, you know, War Captain's Guide was not something that was on my, in my uh, mind. The Inhuman Wars were, uh, Unhuman Wars, were not something that was in my mind uh, as far as. So basically, you, again, you see other people coming in and creating mm. new material that end up, ends up getting added to the collected knowledge and the complete and the collected background. And I do not know, I'd have to do a little digging before I could answer that because I don't remember the infinity sphere. And that may have been something that was like on the agenda and then they, then they killed the line. Because we've done that before with al -Kadim. We did two years with an option for a third, and they said yes to the third. We did the third. We had an option for the fourth, and we had it laid out like what we were going to do in al -Kadim. And they said, okay, we're done. We're going we're gonna to retire it. And that's cool. I mean, that's I think the idea of having a lifespan for products basically keeps them fresh, keeps them from you know repeating too much, right. and basically can, can, can give them a rest. Now, yeah. having said that, I'm sorry we never did a product on the, you know, the the yakman, the evil yakman in Al Qadim. So, God. animal headed animal headed cre uh, creature humanoids are sort of my thing. So yeah, there's usually one that shows up somewhere in the works I've shown up on. They That's... just uh, they released that new race. Did you see that, Rob or Jeff? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was an animal headed thing. It was yeah, oh, the Ardling. Yeah, the Ardling. Yeah, the Ardling. Yeah, Ardling. Yeah, Ardling. Upper planar, um, mm -hmm. uh, kind of plane Opposite touch of a race. Yeah. yeah. That sounds uh, like something that comes out of the planes. background of Manual of the Planes. Yeah. I think we had monsters mm. in the back, and we had several good lawful creatures, Archons, uh, that were, That's you know, right. uh, like light. And basically, we had a hound type uh, character, which was a hound headed humanoid, you know, basically mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So, so you've, you've got that as a, as again, the heritage that we might build off of. Yeah. Someone says they think their, uh, gardenal hybrids was what they were. Um, yeah. Much yeah. like tieflings basically mm -hmm. come out of the infernal planes. Yeah. 
creating things that basically come out of the godly plane, out of the good plane. It, yeah, we we knew them in five E as Asimar, but I believe they right. they're moving towards this Ardling uh, concept. Um, I think we got Asimar has a has a uh, uh, mythological background, doesn't it? it does. As far as a real name, I that's maybe it, why they're moving. It, it comes yeah. maybe it comes from Zoroastrian. Yeah, or something like that. It's um, yeah, it's a. Yeah, they might go with a with, a with a name change as a result. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, I think we've got time for a couple more of our sure. um, our pre-read questions here. Uh, Jason, would you want to ask one more of yours? Um, I I'm out of questions. Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, I've still I've I've got one that's like uh, a personal favorite question that I've I've kind of squared up mainly for myself, um, but I think is. It bears, it bears kind of the public consciousness of 5th edition players. Uh, so, now whilst the Finder's Stone trilogy featured its titular character, Alias, uh, we also saw the birth of another Dungeons & Dragons icon, uh, Champion, more commonly known these days as Dragonbait. Uh, <coughs> when last we saw Dragonbait, as of their 5th edition incarnation, they were off on <coughs> their travels with none other than Volothamp Gadam. If Dragonbait and Volo were to find themselves taking to wild space, how would you envision that? Oh, God. You know, that, that, that would be just a perfect, you know, Bertie and Jeeves type of situation. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, is, is is wise, powerful, and calm. And, of course, Volo is just, you know, he's a little more larcenous than mm -hmm. Bertie was. He's a little more, but he was definitely the guy that's going to go out and get into trouble. Perhaps it's better a Han and Chewie type relationship uh, as far as uh, trying to get into them. I was thinking about the Sarials are mm -hmm. the uh, are, are not native to the realms. You know, they were brought here by Moander. We were very fuzzy about where they came from the uh, originally. So the idea of a Sarial Empire somewhere out there in space is, you know, something that might be actually kind of interesting. And to drop Volo into the middle of that uh, <laughs> uh, mix. Uh, Volo itself, the name comes from um, a town on the, on the Wisconsin-Illinois border called Volo. And it's you used to drive through it all the time uh, to get to Chicago, and it had Volo Bog, and of course the Volo Drugstore, and the Volo Auto Museum, and everything was named Volo. We decided there was a guy named Volo who was responsible. <laughs> so I started running adventures with players, and they're going out to map things, and he would they bring the maps maps back, and he'd publish it as Volo's maps. And then we adopted him and turned him <laughs> into you know the Volo, and Ed gave him the full name Volo Thon uh, Gadarm because you know. Ed cannot go with simple names. Mm -hmm. uh, and he sort of evolved. And Clyde Caldwell was the uh, um, uh, model on the early uh, early uh, uh, covers of that. I think Rob Rupel was the artist. Um, so you, know, you, you see this sort of thing that just, you know, like everybody gets involved and we sort of like grow a character. Volo is a great example of that. So, and now he's got magic cards. So oh, that that's always been <laughs> yeah, an adventure I've wanted to run was, uh, uh, whether it was spell jammer or not, was just dragon bait looking for his home. You know, I always, yes, I always feel mm -hmm. that really deep down. I think people want to see. He, he has a home. Bait he has space. a home in the, home in the Las Vail, but you know, right. but the the idea idea of where you know, he came that, from. That's where, yeah. yeah, I want to know why he doesn't have a tail in the in the uh, in the fifth edition version. That's so, a good you know, question. Uh, yeah, something what, is must he a have gecko happened. now. You know, <laughs> is it just not shown? Basically, is it considered to be okay? Now we're going to be a little older and more conservative, so we're binding it up. In the, I don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> can't show your tail five years. It's, it's, it's again evolution. So it's true. It's true. Um, okay, uh, there's a couple of questions still in the chat here that we haven't asked you. Um, Go for it. Uh, one particular question regards the plasmoids again. They, uh, they love talking about they the plasmoids. They love the plasmoids. <laughs> They're everyone's favorite. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so, in, uh, so you haven't read the 5th edition content yet. The I plasmoids it, are, so. uh, they're baked down and they're a very almost like humanoid tangent ooze like playable race, right? Okay. Um, so Sounds like a character from the Orville, but okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, but... Uh, people want to know because a lot of uh, Spelljammer fans kind of want to make that distinction between the two types of um, of plasmoids, right? Um, the uh, names de I could never pronounce these names. Uh, they're the, some of the that's probably intentional, but yeah. Um, the the D Glaish is that how you say it? De Glaish. 
okay, good. I, I'm glad. If if you don't know how it's said, then then uh, then I'm in the clear. Um, okay. Yeah. How how would you implement those as like potentially sub races or like other player character races? Uh, particularly because um, oh. one of those two sub categories they're huge, right? They're like massive uh, in comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, I do not know because I have not I have not read that material yet, so I don't okay. know. In fact, we've got like like the larger they're larger than man size, they're giant size, etc., and they have to have that effect yeah. on design as far as pluses and minuses. Right. Um, I understand that one of the things they want to do in the D and done, uh, the <laughs> D and D one. Uh, I'm is, glad someone they, they talk, yeah. talk about small figures and tall figures, and basically, you know, not keeping everything man sized. And mm. I think that's got a uh, an interesting, you know, evolution for it. But they really have to figure out what the different size categories are going to do across the across yeah. the board. As far yeah. as these plasmoids, I, when I, when I read it, I'll I'll I'll, I'll look yeah. at something, but I, I do not know. Yeah. It, it was always comical going through the 5e races and reading the description text of you're this muscular monstrosity who towers over other human beings you could eat a building your size is medium and you're like oh, yeah all right we, okay. we basically moved it so that you were up to eight foot tall and one of the things was in the star wars game that was the height of a wookie so you could have a wookie okay. that was a was a was a m size creature <laughs> right. so yeah i i do i do love this shift to these uh allowing some of these iconic medium races to yeah. be small like a pint sized hadozi just speaks yeah. to me like yeah. it's 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 good fun <laughs> uh, yes yeah um yeah, uh, we got D and Dunn. People are big fans of D and Dunn. I think. Okay, uh, oh, God. I've, 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 it's fest halls all over. Again. Okay, <laughs> fine. Um, uh, we have a question here regarding uh, a abandoned campaign setting that turned into uh, Catch of the Day. Uh, uh, the story oh, in yes. Oceans of Magic. Uh, oh my goodness! Yes. How would that have embraced Spelljammer? I don't think it would, just because right. it's carrying a lot of the same sort of tonnage. For those those watching, you can find this like on my blog. Uh, we did a a pitch for a new campaign setting called Stormfront, uh, which was men sail on clouds, and basically the, the good races are up on the tops of mountains, and everything else is underneath the clouds, and it's raining and horrible, and and red and you know hellish and all all the rest of this. And we didn't go forward on it. And I did one short story for it that basically on, on a similar type of type of you know, uh, and it's very uh, Aubrey and Matron, Patrick O'Brien's uh, sailing novels, of which I was a, uh, I am a fan of, and I thought they did you know, a fantastic job, basically carrying it over into a fantastic universe. And what's very interesting is that spell jammer ships are a lot easier to run, I think than a traditional sailing ship, which was the most complex mechanism of its day. I mean, with all, with the lines and the sails and basically how you're going to keep the ship together in the first place. Uh, and it's most organized type of operation, which is I always thought was kind of impressive. Mm -hmm. And basically fitting that into a universe where you're sailing on clouds and how the how does the world building work? How does the mechanics work? How why are you floating on on a cloud? That sort of thing. What happens when you go go off of it? Um, if floatwood, I think was what we called was the uh, was the you know MacGuffin that allowed you to right. do that. But that's that's an ancient that's an ancient story now. But I always wanted to go back to it. I always you know have like two or three ideas that I'd like to you know play with but um but no i i i see it having some of the same overlap with Spelljammer, the ships the crew that sort of thing but it would have a very different different thing i could see you know if it ever got up and running a meetup between the two would mm. be interesting to see because you know basically why are the uh, stormfront ships to be superior you know uh, in their environment as opposed mm. to others oh yeah that's yeah. Certainly, mm -hmm. I, I I love the image of um, things up on a uh, on a cloud, and that that brings me yes. to my next question. Okay, uh, I know this is a bizarre segue, so uh, I have to ask this because Ald's here, and Ald really educated me on this, so uh, I think I have to put forward this one out of respect. Um, so, Giver and Legend of Heavenly Sphere, Shirato, Spirit Warriors, and the Lark Shoe. For okay. many Spelljammer fans, there are seemingly clear homages to some of the most prominent anime and manga series of the 1980s, wow. sprinkled okay. throughout the manuals. 
Okay. Are, are we correct as readers to have identified such references? Further, if these are mm -hmm. confirmed references, are there any mm -hmm. others we should be made aware of? No, I'm afraid. I, okay. I did not have a knowledge of anime at that level mm -hmm. at the time we were, were, were talking about. Uh, in the town of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, uh, our only exposure to um, anime, mm -hmm. uh, oh gosh, you know, would consist of old cartoons that were brought across and amplified, mm -hmm. or uh, getting up to um, uh, the Oriental Theater in Milwaukee for a, for a showing of Akira, mm -hmm. uh, or and one of our number Zeb Cook David Cook was a, a fan of Wuja and anime, yeah. and so we'd go over to his place and we would watch. It would be you know subbed and dubbed. It was I don't think it was even subbed and dubbed. Some of it was just just in Japanese, and we were trying mm -hmm. to figure out what was going on <laughs> as it went went along. So we did I we did not have that level of exposure right. to, you know, to, to a lot of that material. We're talking about the star blazers era type of thing, as far as, yeah. you know, uh, getting stuff up and operating. So mm. we were very much behind the curve as far as exposure to, to anime. Right. But so, so while, while it was there, yeah, yeah not so much, but, I, but I'm, but I think it follows similar themes. Right. But th but those two are, uh, references, right? Um, so, so we have a couple of people who were on the writing team. Uh, Karen Boomgarden and Newton yes. Ewell were yep. uh, self-prophesized big, big anime fans. Do you mm -hmm. think that they they slipped those in there, or uh, it's absolutely possible? Every we, we, a lo we got a lot of pieces <laughs> that have shown up of people's favorite anime or favorite, you know, uh, uh, I, I did not create them, but I definitely identified with them. Mm -hmm. um, the clockwork horrors or Daleks that we, yes. uh, Daleks that we reskinned, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. basically the only way had different colors, different, but they were the aut automated horror type of thing. And basically that, that sort of filled the same niche that we, yeah. we saw for it. I mean, you know, the current edition, a lot of people were going on about space clowns because killer, killer clowns, clowns from outer space was, mm -hmm. was a, you know, a cult film. Uh, as far as far as okay, yeah. now they have clown space. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that that was actually my like my first question was uh, the reference to Daleks and uh, um, yes. yeah, and horrors and now killer clowns. Um, mm -hmm. So so yeah, I mean yeah. basically again, things come in from all sides, mm -hmm. and a lot of you know people put their favorite bits in, and they just continue on. They become part of the part of the whole concrete mix that we have that is is spell jammer. <laughs> Everybody adds to it. Yeah, it is the big uh, kind of melting pot of all manner yes. of inspirations and influences. That's what makes it so cool. It can be whatever you you want it mm -hmm. to be, right? Uh, yeah, and, and we, we talk about Spelljammer as being, you know, silly, goofy, wahoo, but also we had the Unhuman Wars, we yeah. had War Captain's Guide, we had, like, some serious, you know, material in there as well of conflict in space mm -hmm. between various, you know, various groups. So it's a good foundation. Yeah, I think that's what um, kind of gripped people for... What was what has been over thirty years since the yeah. original publication? Yeah, yeah. that's mm -hmm. what that's what gripped me is that that wonderful mixture. That's it's just why it kind of reminds me of anime in a lot of ways because there's a lot of goofy humor, but it does that wonderful balancing balancing act of having also serious drama on on top of that. I think it's the parallel evolution much more than you know anything else. Mm. Okay, so. okay. Uh, so we're, we, we're both we're both dealing from the same from the same yeah, sources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we are just about pressed for time here, but we have one last question in the chat. Okay. Um, Jeff, can you tell us a hilarious story of something memorable that happened in a session when you DM Spelljammer? Wow. Um. Yes, and it was with a play test, and it basically is okay. Why can't we use a Spelljammer for a uh, for a strafing run? And <laughs> I've seen it in action. <laughs> yes, and, and basically it's, it's that large target type of type of operation. Mm -hmm. You got the hull of the ship. You know, it's going to be a shield. And, nope, 
you know, basically enough siege material can basically take it out. Mm. And, you know, the ship starts breaking up and you're in the gravity field. So your, your gravity plane is not as functional as it was. Mm. So when pieces fall off, they're basically going to kick, just plummet to the ground. So they quickly lost the hull of the ship mm. as they were going forward and started sinking more because they, they were losing, you know, losing control and coherence of the ship itself. So it was, it was a traditional galleon type of type of type of setup, but uh, using it uh, a spelljammer as a battlefield tank was an unsuccessful but appreciated experience that uh, the players had. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we have one question just to lead us out here. It's okay. Um, uh, so I, I do want to make one more comment on, on inspiration. Oh, please do. Real quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were talking about various inspirations, Saturday morning cartoons. We had talked about the idea. Um, one thing I want to stress is there's an artist, uh, prog rock back in the, uh, cause we were talking about stuff that influenced named Rodney Matthews. And he did a number of big ship pictures. Uh, one for the ice rigger, which was this huge ship on top of skates and one for, uh, uh, the ether stream, which literally sounds, looks like a very spell jammery type drawing. So if you had a chance to look, look at those, find those up, uh, Rodney Matthews, that's something to look at as if we talk about influences. Yeah, those were definitely influences. Mm. So go, go with our last question. Um, so, uh, you're, you know, you're still very active. Um, in amongst the uh, tabletop RPG mm-hmm. uh, community, um, we we know that you've uh, recently been doing work for uh, Evil Genius, uh, the yes. company that produces um, Everyday uh, Heroes. Everyday Heroes, um, which brings the uh, some of the most you know famed action movie style um, films to the D twenty modern system. Right, that's uh, that's more or less the, the billing of what uh, mm-hmm. what that is um for spelljammer fans is there a particular product or um or manual that you would direct them to from that line what we're doing with um everyday heroes we have the core book which is an update of what was d20 modern into fifth edition thinking ethos that sort of thing and the adventures that we are, are doing are tied in with action movies from the 80s, 90s, and later. So we have like The Crow and Highlander and Escape from New York. Uh, oh, but one man. that we're, we're <sighs> operating on, you know, the, the designer of Escape from New York and one of the co-designers of the original, uh, of the Everyday Heroes lines, like lives in my basement. So he's doing, wow. uh, okay. uh, <laughs> he, he works in my basement. Going because, because, you know, yeah. he, he's got He's got a lot of talent. My role has been design consultant. So I walk around behind people saying, I don't know about that. So, okay. Anyway, <laughs> the one I would recommend, though, you know, for fans would be probably Pacific Rim. Yes. Which is uh, Kaiju, which is giant robots. It's tech versus organic. Mm-hmm. It's not in space. We haven't gone into space yet, but it, it basically has that vibe that we would be looking at for this, you know, Wahoo wild operation. Yeah. So. Whenever someone says the word Pacific Rim, the, the, the sting from the movie just resonates throughout my head. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's, it's mm-hmm. iconic. Um, well, uh, as much as I wish we had uh, more time to continue this conversation, um, uh, Jason is up next on the stream schedule. Uh, Jason, would you like to tell people what you're about to head off and do? Uh, we are continuing a story in our homebrew universe that uh, is about a, a player who used to play along with me and her surrogate son, an autonome that she, in one of our first sessions, decided to adopt and became one of the core members of our group. <laughs> so uh, he is going to be attempting to maybe try to turn himself from his uh, his construct form into a real boy so he can be a real part <laughs> of their family. So <laughs> should be uh, should be pretty fun and, and wacky. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Go have fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, for those of you who, uh, you know, want to hear more from Jeff, uh, make sure to uh, head over and check out his blog, uh, Grubs, uh, uh, Grub Street. Um, Grubs Street. And also... Grubstreet.blogspot.com. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. you, your Twitter handle is at Grubs Tweet, correct? Yeah. Brilliant yes. marketing. Uh, <laughs> Dan Brown. Dan Brown thought that. He, mm-hmm. he decided I needed a Twitter. Twi- mm-hmm. And there is a Jeff Grub out there that, you know, 
Yes. He does computer games. So I mm-hmm. became Grub's tweet. Yeah, he seems to get so. a lot of things that are supposed to be directed to you. Uh, yes. Him. I have a story, but you guys need to move on. Yeah. So. <laughs> wow. Well, unfortunately, yeah. everyone, uh, that, that will have to conclude our special interview panel uh, for our first Jamacon. Uh, hopefully, as we have been saying throughout the day, there will be a Jamacon 2 uh, more, uh, more or less soon. It'd be awesome to get uh, you know more of the major influences like Jeff uh onto one of these interviews uh, at a later date so uh thank you chat for being here with us uh, thank you for some awesome questions um you know it makes it uh even more fun and enjoyable to interact with you guys while we while we conduct these interviews okay well uh okay. we are going to raid into jason's channel so uh, i'm going to yeah, leave the stream I'm, I'm gonna... idle. For a little I was going to say, let, yeah. I'll pop out and, and get that up so you can rate it. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, I've been playing Spelljammer for years, so it's a awesome opportunity to be able to talk with you about it. Mm-hmm. Thank you for having me. This has been real fun. Oh, thank you very much, Jeff. Right. We're, we're honored. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, so until right. until then, out. everybody, jam on, as uh, as we say. <laughs>